Good evening. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Lord for bringing me again to share with you one more time. And I'm sure it's not the last one. And uh, I thank Marie and Paul and all of you for all the love and goodness that you have had with me all this time. I just came back from uh, Combermere in Ottawa and had great experiences up there with Joe Martin whose sister is here present with us tonight. We welcome you. And uh, tonight we, um, we spoke with Marie and Paul that I was going to share with you a talk about the soul's economy. This sounds a little different. I'm going to explain to you why, what is called that way. And um, before that, I'd like to um, read you what I just got to start this talk. The Lord gave me this word. Um, Romans 14, 1. The weak and the strong. Accept him whose faith is weak, without passing judgment on disputable matters. One man's faith allows him to eat everything, but another man whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. For God has accepted him. Who are you to judge someone, someone else's servant? To his own master he stands or fails. And he will stand for the Lord is able to make him stand. One man considers one day more sacred than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. He who regards one day as special does so to the Lord. He who eats meat eats to the Lord, for he gives thanks to God. And he who abstains does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this very reason, Christ died and returned to life, so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. You then, why do you judge your brother? Or why do you look down on your brother? For we, we all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, As surely as I live, says the Lord, Every knee will bow before me. Every tongue will confess to God. The word of the Lord. So I think this is very proper for the talk. Um, while I went to this experience that you already know, this mystical experience with the Lord, I, was, I went through, through um, an experience with sin where the Lord showed me how is, is it that we are constantly dealing with, um, with uh, the good and the evil. We know that, that's, that basic knowledge of every Christian and every human being. Every day we deal with good and evil. What it is with us when we are not completely faithful to the Lord and we are not loyal to the ways of God, is that we have not a real conscious of the accounts that are being weighed in, in our behalf or against us. And these accounts is not exactly like someone is sitting with a book taking numbers of everything you do. But it is, in a way, if we look at it from a human point, a standpoint, it is the same. Because it, it happens this way. If we are conceived in a womb of, of a mother that is in mortal sin, and is in conceivers through fornication, the kid is already placed in a situation that is extremely delicate. Some kids are going to be aborted because of those circumstances. Some make it, and make it, and maybe reject it already, because the mother was so conflicted about giving birth to this child that maybe the, doesn't even know the father, that that the, the child was rejected originally, and maybe by the grace of God end up living, but that is just practically a miracle. Then what happens? That kid is coming in into this world with a lot of disadvantages, but God's grace and justice and love 
comes upon himself with baptismos. Let's say we ask ourselves, what about a kid that is not baptized? What happened with him? What happened with, with God is that God is about love. Love is what surrounds us, and love is our essence. Then, let's, let's speak about one of us, a Christian, someone that is baptized and has the grace, receives the grace of baptismos. There are millions of Christians around the world that are fornicating and that give, give birth to kids out of fornication, being Christians. And they don't repent, they just do it, and they continue doing it. And the kids grow up like that, and they, get, they, they are baptized because they have this cultural Christianity. They follow what they inherit, even though they do not practice. So, in the soul's economy, the way the Lord explains it, He's giving us a sense of knowledge about where are we standing related to every act that we commit in our favor or against us. What does it mean and how does it work? You see, we have to realize angiology. There is such a thing as angiology, and we, I think you all know this. There are angels, angels, angels of God and angels of Satan. So we realize this, and at the same time, we have to be aware of what it means. What, what is, why do we have, why did God create angels? What are they doing? You see, the Lord taught me something, and this is also written. Everything exists at once. We are, we are it. We are part of the whole creation. The invisible and the visible is part of our life. We are related to what we don't see and related to what we see as equally. We are related. What we cannot see, we are not physically related consciously because of original sin. We are deaf, mute, and blind to the spirit because of original sin, only until we are in this flesh. After we leave the body, we're going to be aware of it and be present in it consciously because that's the end of this journey in the flesh. So, when we are born out of a, a womb that was in mortal sin, and then we get to baptisms, at the moment of baptisms, that soul is forgiven everything. It's, it's released and detached from every attachment of ancestors, sins of the mother. We do not inherit sin, but we do carry the consequences of sin. To explain that, we, we realize that some people are born with diabetes, with with some kind of diseases that come through the family. So that, that, that is genetical inheritance. And some people come with a spiritual inheritance that are from the dark, through sin, from ancestors, like tendencies to vice. Some people come with alcoholisms, not only in the blood, but alcoholisms in the spirit also. They are inclined to drink. They have this tendency to vice that is very strong sexual in, immorality, sexual impurities that come with them. Since they are little, you can start seeing sometimes in a child that the child is inclined to sexual impurities. And then lying, some people are growing up lying, some people grow, grow up stealing since they are little, and violent since they are little, and many of these things come with us. So this is what the Lord calls the soul's economy. We are dealing here with a lot of areas that the Lord, by grace, gives us to know. Because, you see, everything that we get to know is a grace of God, regardless of how we get it, how we receive it. And it's up to us to receive it, because the Lord is always teaching us. The Lord is always showing us the way. And also we get to, to points in our life where we are ready to receive a grace and a little more of knowledge. And you see, the, the, the problem with all of this is that most of the time we don't want to be ready, even though we are. But the Lord continues. The Lord continues serving. And He will serve till the end. He will ever serve for us. So we are the ones that turn down His service. Like Jesus said, I came here to serve, not to be served. When He was watching the feet of the apostles and Peter was refusing, the Lord is explaining what He's doing. And he wanted us to do the same. He, the, what it is, is, let's say you graduated from high school. Okay, you are ready to go to college. You are ready to make another move. There's another step in education. But being ready, and sometimes you don't want to be ready. You don't want to continue being ready. And many times, 
it happens to be that you decide to get married. So you get married. And once you marry, you decide you're not ready to be married. Even though you are ready to be married, that's why you got married. And so on, everything happens this way, you know? We get to the point where the Lord gives us growth. And through growth, we understand our position related to what, what, what we're facing and related to our obligations with others and with God. So all of this is accountable against or in our favor, against us or, or, or pro us, you know? So then what the Lord is teaching here is on one hand, we have to realize something. If we are part of Adam and Eve, if we are connected in the flesh, this flesh is the same flesh of the original fathers and is the same flesh of the whole humanity. That's why within us, we have an incredible wisdom that is dormant most of the time, but is there. Each one of us is an ancient, ancient flesh. You know, the flesh is ancient. Our soul is fresh, and it is young, and is ready, and is vibrant with God. But the flesh is heavy, and it's ancient. It comes from far away. It comes from Adam and Eve, thousands and thousands of years in the flesh. And this we all carry. We carry this. This is our cross. This is what Jesus carries to. This is what he's going to carry until he comes back. And this is what we all carry as Christians. The Lord is calling us to understand the way of the flesh. We carry not only the sense of the flesh that we are facing, we carry also the sense of the flesh of humanity. So we are here facing technology and fa facing all of these incredible things that men have discovered and acquired and, and conquered. But all of these things are results of humanity. At the same time, we are facing here all the flaws. All of these incredible revenge and violence and wars and terrorists and all of this is part of the same concert this concept that goes in and out between good and evil all the time. So the Lord wants us to be really aware and not to be conflictive and not to be too compromised with the whole picture because he wants us to live our little life. He wants us to be concerned about our little way because most people, and especially today in our church, this is the battle of the end times, and we all know it. I don't think this is a secret to any Christian that is committed to God. There are millions of people going to church worldwide in our Catholic church that just go to Mass on Sunday. And then they hardly ever take a confession. They can care less about understanding the mystery of the Eucharist. And it's a big Mass. Thanks God that still, at least we have them. You know, they could be pagans, all of them. So at least they come into church. The Lord is, is, is keeping them at the gate, you know. Then there is a, a large amount of Catholics around the world also that are aware of the times, because they are aware. You see, all of these other people that come into the church, and if you go to Sunday Mass in a big city, regardless of where you are in the world, you go into church, and you see, let's say, 500 people at Mass. And then when the time of communion comes up, most of the time, the 500 get up and take communion. And you can bet that not even, not even 30 or 20% of them have taken confession in a long time and they all taking communion. See, it's just like a cultural event. You know, you go in there to receive the Lord. Most, most people are not prepared to receive the Eucharist. You see, most people are not committed, really, with the sacraments. They are just walking with it. They're walking with it and considering it. They, they're thinking sometimes. Uh, so if you tell them about the mystery of the Eucharist, they may consider thinking about it because they haven't really even given it a thought. Regardless of catechism, regardless of, of formal Christian education, people haven't gotten deeper into the mystery. Therefore, there is not a real personal relationship with God still. So the times that we're living in today, we that are aware, obviously you're here tonight, you have been here so many times. You have been here interceding, praising the Lord, sharing the love of God, interceding for all of your personal needs and the needs of the community, like tonight, you know, fighting for the rights of, of God. God is asking us to be pure. God is not asking us to be animals, you know, and to go up there and do these horrors, you know, that homosexuals do. We're not going to judge homosexuals. We judge homosexuality. Because the Lord 
is asking us to, dis to, to discern very well. We cannot judge a homosexual because a homosexual is a sinner and he is a creature. And God is going to give a chance to every creature on earth to attain salvation regardless of what the creature is doing. But we could judge homosexuality because that is Satan. And that is the difference. We have to be aware of that. Homosexuality is Satan because it's written in the Bible and we as Christians know that that is what it is. The thing is that because of the society we live in, we have fallen so weak that homosexuality became normal through science, through atheist science. So now it's becoming law and we have to follow these things that are so horrible. So all we can do is pray really hard to the Lord. So he gives us the strength to be continually walking with our cross and witnessing the times. Witnessing the times that we are little by little facing and going to face worse than we've seen. Not because I came here to give you a horror talk, but I'm, I'm telling, talking to you about the times we're living in. So the Lord is telling us that we have to be aware of the battle we are in, the warfare, spiritual warfare. This is what it is all about. Regarding where we are at with the account we have in our little life, our little walk, we have to realize this. The church today is filled with information from the supernatural, visions and prophecies and all kind of manifestations in many, many millions of ways. Some of them are true, some of them are not. You see, then the question is, how do we know? How do we know? The Lord, a lot of the times we say, if he gives me peace, it comes from God. Well, that's fine. That is a good take. But then the Lord says this, he says this, you have to understand the most important part of all this secret. And it is, I call you to carry your cross. I didn't call you to carry everybody's cross, or I didn't, I didn't tell you to give your cross to everybody. I call you to carry your own cross, so I call you to live your own little life. So that's why there is so much confusion, because people are talking about the whole picture. You see the big problem. But the problem is that very few people are doing the little life and the little way. So that's why they are not making a difference in the community or in society. Because they are no real witness of God. Because the Lord is calling us to be real. To be in a real conversion. So that we are lanterns of God. So that we can illuminate people by being what we are of God and not by pretending to be what God is calling us to be, by speaking so clearly and so wisely about God's law and righteousness, when we really are not being that, really, really in our own little Christian life. So the Lord is placing us in a position where we have to wake up. The times that we are living in today are extremely demanding. The warfare is tough, and it's going to get tougher. And why is it going to get tougher? Because we're going to be threatened more and more within our church. We see already the things that are happening in the church. We don't need to even discuss them because we should not repeat what is evil. We should, we should just pray and rebuke it. That's what we should do. But in our hearts, we know what I'm talking about. There are a lot of things that have to be rebuked every day that are happening inside the church. So the Lord is calling us urgently, urgently to really get back into our heart and send him there, feel him there, talk to him there, be there, and, and, and recreate, recall in there, and understand yourself, understand your way, your little life, your little cross. Each one of us is a cell of the cross. And you see, when you take a human cell, you take all the, the, the properties of the whole body. We know that. It's the same thing happened with our spirit. It's a cell of the cross, or so it has a cross. We are a cross. We are a cross. All of us form the body of Christ, and we, each one of us is a part of the cross. We are, each one of us is a cross. So the, the source economy tell, tells us that if we are born with all of this ancient flesh that has been here on earth since day one, and we're carrying it with us, and then we have this sense of knowing so much, but, but incapable of doing anything about it. Most of the time, we feel helpless with all the things that we know and we can apply, we cannot use. Because you see, every one of us know the answer to most everything that happens to us. 
Most of the time we don't want to admit it because most of the time the answers that we get, we don't want to hear them because they are not convenient for us. And also we don't want to go that way because we know it's very difficult and painful and it brings suffering and then we don't want that. So we try to avoid that because our nature, our human nature through the flesh that is so heavy is tending us always to find something that do not bring any pain. So we walk in for comfort, we walk in for peace, we walk in for this, but we're not walking for suffering, pain, or tribulation, or hardship. No way. If anyone brings me here some kind of trouble, I try to avoid that. I try to walk away because I don't want to deal with it, because I want peace. I want to be comfortable. I don't want anybody to bother me. I want peace. I want to be by myself. I'd rather be by myself. But I don't want to have all this confusion in my life, all this travel, all this suffering, all of this. And then apparently this is all justified, you know. But the truth is, it is not. Because the Lord is calling us to keep the account going on the side of the light. Because every time we refuse to carry our pain, our suffering, everything that comes our way, we are going into a negative account. Because our soul starts growing sour you know, sad, depressed, confused, and resented, remorseful, and also shameful, and so many things that come with the dark, so many things that come with sin. Sin brings you into a corner, puts you against the corner, on your own self, against your own self, and you start blaming yourself. At the end, you, you, you end up blaming everybody else, because that's what happened also with a soul that is present in front of God, and finds out that he's in a lot of trouble, and then spent a whole life, wasted the grace of being in the flesh and using it for grace, and then at that moment he starts blaming himself, that soul starts blaming himself, and going deeper into shame, deeper into shame. At the end, at the end of that, he starts hating God and goes to hell. Not, not because God sent him there, but you see the same thing happen with the two lovers when they, when they break up, and then one goes away, and he's, he's the one taking the guilt of the breaking up. And he tries to come back to regain that relationship and is not able to get it. So what happens? He starts hating himself, blaming himself, feeling really weary about himself for doing wrong and for not being able to keep that relationship that he loves so much. At the end, what happens is start hating the other person. That's usually human love. But then it happens with the soul and God, the same thing. That's why we can explain how souls end up in hell. Why? All of this is because of self-love and pride. I don't want to take it because I hate myself for not being able to do it. How could I be so stupid? That, when you talk to yourself like that, it's self-love is pride. And pride is what kills you. So <clears throat> we take the kid that is born out of a, a mortal sin into baptism. Okay, the kid is baptized, forgiving, his account is in zero. Right? God forgave everything. God release you from attachments for ancestors. You're going to have the tendencies. You're going to have them. Because that is the battle we all have. You see, regardless of baptisms, we're going to have to walk through this life feeling like we want to do something wrong most of the time. Because we are inclined to sin through this flesh. Because this flesh is like a satellite of, of, the, of the bad, you know? A satellite of sin. Because it is the product of sin. But we have the spirit. We have the soul that maintains us in the power to dominate the beast, to dominate this lower self. The Lord says this is a vehicle and it's sacred. If we turn it into the vehicle of God, but this is also our worst nightmare, if we give it up to the service of Satan, because it turns into, into a trash can of Satan where he puts all the excrement through sin. But the Lord is, is telling us if we get baptized, even though we were born out of this horrible sin of the mother and all of that, and we are even... We are fun. God, God gives us the opportunity to be a new creature in Jesus Christ because it's a new creation. It's a new creature. We start walking through this world with the advantages of being a newborn creature in God because of re redemption through Jesus Christ. And what happened? Later on down the road, you start falling down and you start falling back into these old accounts. You see, when you fall down, it's like when you have been gone to a bankruptcy and spend a few years without any credit, and all of a sudden you get credit back from one bank or somebody, you get credit back. If you go back again and, and mess up and do something wrong with the credit, every time it's going to get harder. It's, you're going to end up 
that without anything, because nobody's going to ever believe you any longer. So the account that we have with God is not much different, not because God's mercy is ever ending. God is always merciful. God is always waiting for us. But the ones that cannot accept it is us, because of pride and self-love. So when we fall in sin, after we have received the grace to be at peace with God, then we go back into the roots that we originally came with. If you came through this mortal sin of your mother, and you came through all of these circumstances of the flesh that inherit so much darkness and so much sin, then you fall in mortal sin yourself, you're going to be standing in the middle of all of the bad that you came with. And that's why a lot of people don't understand why their lives is so horrible, why things seem to be working and all of a sudden everything goes wrong. And all of a sudden things are working and all of a sudden things go wrong. But people don't notice sometimes that that is what is happening with their relationship with God. Because that is the nature of the real relationship with God. If you do have a relationship with God that is real, and you stick into the light regardless of the pain that it costs, because to be loyal to God is painful. Is the, what is the biggest suffering of this life? To be loyal to God, to obey the commandments. That is the heaviest cross we can ever carry. You see, if you really think about it, to obey the commandments, be loyal to God, and carry our own cross in silence, it is the biggest suffering. Because that goes against the world, that goes against everything around you. Because everything around you is telling you exactly the opposite, completely the opposite. You're not supposed to do that. Otherwise, you do not succeed. To the point where people, sometimes a lot of people are religious, devoted, they are into great penances and sacrifices and, and large, large uh, giving into the Lord and to the church. But most of the time, a lot of those people are doing it for safety, only for safety, because they don't want to go to hell and they want to make sure everything is okay. You see, so I have to be okay, I have to be good. Wait, 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 I think I'm failing here and I'm failing. I'm very, and they are very meticulous about talking about what's going wrong in their lives. But why are they doing that? Because they are doing it for safety. They're not doing it for the love of God. See, that is a big difference. And what happened with those creatures? They are miserable inside. And then you, you, you wonder, how come this person is so committed to God? He's doing so much for God. And I see this person just, just hitting herself or himself with a whip day and, long, day and night, you know, castigating himself because committed a little sin. And then you see that person is miserable, is it's in a bad mood most of the time, has no patience with anyone. Things are weird, you know, things are wrong, things are very wrong, pessimistic, really dark and weary. And then you, you ask yourself, what's going on? What's going on? You see, are we doing the right thing? What happened with faith is that faith is love. Real faith is about love. When we love, we trust. And when we trust, we are free, and when we are free, we are happy. And when we are happy, because it's, it's God's happiness in our heart, we are able to walk with the strength and the courage that God gives us when He dwells within us. We're strong, we're real, we open, we're free, we, 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 are, we are enlightened. And then, when someone is playing this kind of circumstance, you see that happens in every circumstance in life. Some people get married because of the same reasons. They don't want to be alone. They want to have some kind of safety and security. They want to have someone to love them. They want to have this and the other. Basically, this is all okay, because this is our human nature. We look for the things to look for a balance and a harmony in our little human life. But the problem is this. If the only reason that you got married was that, your marriage is going to be a miserable marriage. Because the day one of these little things that you marry for are not working, you're going to go against the partner because it's not working the way you expected it, the way you planned it, the way you need it. So then the whole conflict starts. Same thing happens with relationships of any kind, people, friendship. Uh, even in the church, if someone comes in and is not getting the right attention and that person didn't come for the right reasons, only came to be among people, to be accepted, to be, you know, bring into, uh, into the light and everybody to be aware of him or something like that, if that person doesn't get that attention, it's going to start feeling bad. And it's going to be creating problems in the group. And that happens everywhere. So what the Lord is calling us to do is to take into account the numbers. 
How are we dealing with faith? How are we dealing with sin? How are we doing? But in reality, because the Lord is very clear about telling us that we have a battle here, very intense, and it's permanent, and it's the battle of the fallen angels and the angels of God, guardians of virtue from God, guardians of vice from hell. So we walk in like this. We have these armies going on. The armies of God are immense. You know, it's like uh, the prophet told his servant, just look out the window and see that we are much more than them. Many more, many more. When this whole army was coming to take Elias, was that? <coughs> or the prophet that was in the house and the whole army came to pick him up to kill him and he sent his servant. He looked out the window and saw all the angels of the Lord there. He himself defeated them. So this is what happened to us in our regular life. We have a battle around us that is real. And Jesus talked that to us in the, in the gospel. You see, it's very clear in the gospel. The Lord is speaking about the angels and he's speaking about Satan. And what happens is that we take the gospel, we take the knowledge of God as a whole picture, like a universal picture. And we cannot take it into our own little life. And that's why we cannot apply what we have and the wisdom that God gave us to our own little things because we have it in a big picture. You see, we have it in the big Bible. We have it in the big conferences. We have it in the big homilies. We have it in every in these big books that we read, but we don't have it in our little heart. See, the Lord is asking us, you have to bring everything I gave you to your bones. Do not bring it to your head because your head is going to play games with you. You see, it's not about feeding the intellect. Christ is not about the intellect. Christ is about the heart. The heart first. Then the heart is going to feed the intellect. Like St. Paul says, what good does it do if everything stays spiritual and do not sink into the intellect? You're never going to be able to do anything with it. And at the same time, what good does it do if everything remains intellectual and is never going to the heart? It's not going to be worth anything. So that's why... We have to re realize that today we are living at times where things can be really, really confusing as far as what should we take in. There are so many enemies growing up around us and, and, and growing larger in numbers and in, 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 in strategies. We, let's take an example that we're dealing with today. The Lord brought this today, and that's why I'm using it. And I'm sure He is using it that way. Homosexuality. We have this bill tomorrow. Okay. This is a great enemy of morality, a great enemy against our kids, a great enemy against our own Christian heart. You know, it hurts. It's, it just hurts. And then, what do we do? We have, we have governments around the world that are going for, because this is a whole movement worldwide. And we know this. We have seen this happen in Holland. They pass laws that they do anything they want there, and in many other places. In California, is like... I'm sure you know what's going on there, all the things that are taking place in that field, you know. So we say this, the Lord is asking us one thing, always, and it is, be aware that you are traveling through the world and you are pilgrims. You're going through this, and the world is bad. The world, he said, you know, the apostle says, the world is under the devil's hands. But that doesn't mean we are, but the world is. So we have to realize these things. We, we are here walking with Christ, but we are walking through the world. And the world of today is going to get darker and worse than ever because we are at this end battle. So we're going to see the, the most horrendous immorality come upon us and around us and all over us. And then at this time is when we have to stand up and be very careful, very, very careful. We have to stand up for our rights. We have to do what we're doing. We have to do what, what you were presenting tonight and what we all pray for. We have to do that. But at the same time, with a clean heart. Because if we do not do it with a clean heart, we're going to sin. And we're going to fall for the trap of Satan. Why is Satan making so much noise with homosexuals? In order to get us to fall. You see? Because if you buy that, you may fall in the trap of Satan. You see? It's like... Uh, if, if you are very scrupulous and someone knows that you will be completely devastated 
if, they, if you have a party at home and someone walks in the house with two prostitutes, you know, then you say you're going to go completely insane. And most likely the person that brought those prostitutes in the house is going to get, I don't know what from you. You're going to probably never ever going to talk to that person in your life for the rest of your life. Satan knows this. He knows how to get to us. You see, he knows how to present the pictures. Today, we are going through the passion of the church. And then the passion of the church is the pain that we are going through with homosexuals. It's the pain that we're going through with all the immorality in the world. The pain that we're going through with Harry Potter, with the internet, with all these amazing, horrible, satanic influences and, and things for the children, and even for, for the adults, for everyone. The, the pornography, all of these things are growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And then, if we do not know how to stand with these numbers clear in the presence of God all the time, regardless of what's going on, then we're going to sink into sin because we're going to become scrupulous. And we're going to become too righteous. And at that moment, we'll start tripping. And that's what the devil wants. That's exactly what he wants. He wants to get us to trip in the midst of this illusion. And what happened? This world is an illusion. You see, it's a transitory illusion. So it's not about what's going on in the world. It's about what's going on in my heart. That's what it's about. So that's why the whole picture of the world can distract us and take us about worry about the whole picture. But then we stop worrying about our little things. And that's what Satan wants. He wants to keep us in the future or in the past so we are not here now to receive the graces that are going to come upon us. It's like, it's like having... Having a, a vase here, that it has to be in the same place in order to receive this water that is coming from the top. The vase has to be stable. If it's moved, the water is going to go here or there. That is exactly what we are in the presence of God. If we don't stay where we're supposed to stay, there, and maintain ourselves in grace, that water falling up from heaven is not going to reach us because we are constantly moving between past and future, between good and evil. We are not stable. We don't stick to it. So in the economy of the soul, the, the Lord is asking about realizing when we look back at our lives, we can almost instantaneously have a present account of how, how we're doing. Because we know. We know how much damage we have, we have done to others. We know how much damage we have done to ourselves. And we know how much we have done to, to repair, to change that, and how much we have repented, how much we have felt the pain, or how indifferent we have been towards, to our, throughout the whole deal. So we know instantaneously. In an instant, you know how you're doing. You see, the Lord says, the economy of the soul is so important, but it's so present in our lives, that all you need to do is be very sincere, very sincere, to do a real act of contrition. And stand up there in the presence of God and realize yourself. Realize yourself in an instant. We all know how we're doing. We all know. We ju it's just hard to take it. Because if we realize exactly how we, what, what we have done, then we might get really scared. And we, might, we feel we lose the ground. But that is not true. The Lord wants us to lose the ground. Because that ground where we stand in is called pride. It's called self-love. It's a fake ground. A false ground. And that's the ground that keeps us fooling, fooling us. So the Lord said, let the ground go. Just, just be up in my arms. Hang in. I'm not going to drop you. I'm not going to drop you. Come to me and realize yourself as you really are. Because I gave you the wisdom through the Holy Spirit to realize yourself just like you are. See, if you really give in and present yourself to your consciousness, you will be illuminated. Now we're talking a lot about the prophecy of illumination of consciousness. I tell you, we are in it now. The times that we live in it now are calling for illumination of consciousness. If we do not get it on our own, the Lord is going to give it to us at once. But you are able to get it because it's there, it's present, it's within us now due to the times that we are going through right now. We, we can go to that. If you stand with sincerity and love and humility and just tear down self-love and tear down pride. At that moment, you're going to be in the presence of God naked and with the truth in your hand, knowing how you're doing. There are a lot of things, like they call skeletons in our closet, that we don't want to bring out. 
and we should bring them all out. It's just like when, when winter is over or any season is over that it's been drastic and you have accumulated a lot of things, you start cleaning the house, bringing the, the wind and letting the air come in through the, the rooms that were closed for so long. We have to do that with ourselves. The Lord insists that the times that we live in today are times where we really have to be strict. Because if we are not strict, we are going to be going through a lot of confusion. Because the world is going to turn more and more aggressive as far as morals, as far as impurity, as far as all the threats that we have as Christians, as Catholics. Everything is against our faith and it's going to grow weary and more aggressive. So we have to be stronger. And how, how can we get stronger? Becoming saints, walking into sainthood is the only defense we're going to have. You see, if you, don't walk in, if you don't walk into the light with all the force of the Holy, Holy Spirit, you're not going to make it. You're going to be extremely confused. Because if you are going to be alive within 10 years, if you're still around, I'm sure it's going to be heavier and heavier and unbearable and impossible if you are not really, truly changed, change completely in your life. And not telling more time. I don't know how worse this can get. And we're not talking about how worse it can get. We're talking about how good it could get if we really do it right. So the Lord is bringing us You see, every time you commit a sin that you haven't confessed, you have a guardian of the dark with you. He is the guardian of vice, the guardian of sin. When you are in grace with the Lord, your guardian angel has a force on your behalf that is un unbelievable because he, everything you do works for your own grace, for the grace of others, for, for the glory of God constantly because you're walking on the light. When you fall falling back in sin, you have these guardians of sin that want to promote that sin and don't want to let you go because they are guarding that. Our life is a very little instant in eternity. In this little instant, millions of souls are wasted because we fall into the illusion to forget about how transitorial and short this life is. So if you really look, if one of the things about illumination of consciousness, just look at your little self right now and realize how fast all these years have gone by. It's like a dream. It's like this. The next thing you know, you have kids. The next thing you know, they are gone. The next thing you know, everybody's dying around you. And all of the things are happening very fast. And then we have to realize that is the most important thing you have to realize. Because we don't want to get caught up with staying very comfortable here where we are. Because this is not a solid ground. This is quicksand. And really quicksand. Real one. Because this is moving all the time. And you can't get stuck in there. You have, to, you have to jump really fast through it. Go through very fast. Because the next thing you know, it's over. It's over. And everything we do here is related to eternity. It's not related to mortality. Mortality is going to go. It's going to pass. This body is going to be buried. All the dreams, all the things that you have and plan and did are going to go. So what is going to stay? Everything you did is related to, mortali to immortality. Mortality is going to go. Everything. So what we do here only counts if we do it with love. Everything that we do that has no love, that is unloving, is going to be against us, and it's going to be just a torment, a horrible torment, that it may take us even to hell. God forbid. But it can even drag us into the dark forever, because little by little unloving acts are taking us away from God. So obviously, I don't believe that anyone here present today is going to be in hell. I know that. But the, one of the things, well, we didn't say I swear about that, but I, uh, you, you, don't, you, don't you think that this is the way we feel, each one of us, that we are aiming for heaven? We know the Lord. The Lord is with us. The Lord is blessing us. And we have all the reasons to believe that we are going to be saved and that we are all going to heaven. And then the, the, the question is, are we going to have to go through purgatory? The Lord is giving us all the tools and the power not to go to purgatory, to be able to go to heaven from the flesh. And in a, in a world like this today, people, when they say, if you go to a friend and tell him, I want to become a saint, most likely it's going to laugh in your face, you know, because it's a joke to talk like this. You see, it's the world we live in is so incredibly decadent that, you, that talking about becoming a saint, it is a joke completely, even among Christians. 
<clears throat> people will laugh at you right in the church, maybe. If you tell them right in the pew, I want to become a saint, maybe right there they laugh at you. You see, it, that's how bad it is. And the, and, the reason, and the truth is this, if we don't become saints, we can't go to heaven. Heaven is only for saints. So imagine how ridiculous it is to forget about that. We have to become saints if we want to go to heaven. It's the only way to heaven. So what are we doing? Are we falling asleep? You see, don't let yourself be caught up with this game. We have to wake up. Wake up for real. We got to become saints. Even though it might sound really weird and even stupid for a lot of people. But it's the only way to heaven. So I tell you, we don't want to become saints in purgatory. That's for sure. It is very painful. So we have to become saints here. And it hurts. It hurts and it hurts. But it's the best way to go. It's the way because the Lord gave us all the power, all the tools, everything he gave us to become saints. You know, and what hurts more about becoming a saint is the pain of the others. Because when you start going, going into sainthood, you start feeling the wake of everybody's sins and everybody's damnation because you feel for them. You love them. You don't want anybody to go to hell. You don't want anyone to go to hell, regardless of how evil they are. You want everybody to be safe. Because that is Christ walking with his cross through Calvary, feeling the pain and the weight of the whole world. And that is each one of us, when we become a Christian for real, we are Christifying ourselves and we are sanctifying ourselves. We start feeling the weight of everybody's sins, the weight of everybody's possible damnation. Then we suffer. And that is the moment of sainthood. You start growing up for real. You see, because it's not about being joyful in the heart and then turning your life into a party. It's not about that. You see, there are a lot of Christians around the world celebrating resurrection and celebrating salvation. And they praise and praise and praise the Lord. But nobody speaks about suffering. No one. You see, and that is what is wrong with Christianity. Because we, it's, not a, it's about praising the Lord. It's about loving God. It's about always doing it for the glory of God, but it's about understanding that we're dragging the cross. And we are giving it to Him too, silently, but we are suffering. We are feeling it. We have to take it in. We have to take it in and not to give it to others. We have to take it in with the Lord. So, to end, I'm going to, to ask the Lord for His words. And the Lord takes me to Jeremiah 15. Then the Lord said to me, Even if Moses and Samuel were to stand before me, my heart will not go out of the, to these people. Send them away from my presence. Let them go. And if they ask you, where shall we go? Tell them, this is what the Lord says. Those destined for death, to death. Those for, to the, for the sword, to the sword. Those for starvation, to starvation. Those for captivity, to captivity. I will send four kinds of destroyers against them, declares the Lord. The sword to kill and the dogs to drag away, and the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. The word of the Lord. We can never take these words into our heart the way they sound, because the word of the Lord is pure and is healing. It heals. And a lot of people get scared when they hear the Lord speaking with so much grace and wanted to blow everything up and destroy everybody. You see, we're talking about the God of the Old Testament. And what he's telling us, we are defeating and rebuking the dark when we speak the word of the Lord. And he's talking about that kind of evil and that kind of people and that kind of betray, uh, treason and all of this. We're talking about the dark. We're defeating the dark with the word of the Lord. So it's good to proclaim the word of the Lord when it comes with this force and the... What are we doing? We, we can't relate to those people. We are not the ones that are going to be punished like this. Who is going to be that way? Who is going to be punished? Satan and his army. That's why he's going, to, he's going to be punished. We are not part of that army. That's why we give thanks to the Lord for rebuking Satan tonight at the end of this talk. Anything that was in the dark, so that Lord, the Lord can free us. The Lord can release us from, from doubts. So that the Lord can give us the strength and the power to really stand here and realize what we had to do. And realize that we have everything in us given by Jesus in order to conquer what we have to conquer. Salvation. Salvation. Resurrection after the death of this flesh. And the Lord is guaranteeing that to us. Because he did it. 
He gave it to us. We are witnesses of that. And we know in our hearts that it's true. But also we know that we have to do it. Because like the saints does, the saint says, he says, God created you without you, but he cannot save you without you. So we have to work really hard because the Lord wants to save us, but we have to do the work. We have to go there and do the job. And then he wants us to do the little job, the job that we are called to do, our own little life. Because if we do it right, that little job is going to be for everyone to enjoy, for everyone to receive blessings and be illuminated through us. May God bless you and keep you safe and under his guiding light and keep you really in this road of sainthood. Amen.